Hello everyone, welcome to the last chapter of A-Level Physics, chapter 31, Measuring the Universe. And this is the chapter outline. You'll be introduced to many different terms that are used in astronomy. Now, first of all, I believe that most of you have heard of the term constellation. Just a fun fact, stars and constellation, they are usually not physically close with each other. Constellations are just 2D projections of the 3D space. So one thing you need to know is that sometimes apparent brightness, it doesn't represent distance. So if a star is very bright, it doesn't mean that they are close to us. It could also be due to their luminosity, something that we'll talk about in a bit. And the brightness often depends on two things, the luminosity, as I mentioned just now, and also distance from the Earth. A dim star nearby can appear brighter than a luminous star far away. So luminosity is just the total energy emitted per second by a star. It measures the actual power of a star, not how bright it looks like. And the units is in watts. So for example, the luminosity of the sun is 3.8 times 10 to the power of 26 watts. So before we talk about how to calculate all that, something that you have to know is that scientists use standard candle. Standard candle is just an astronomical object. So we have two examples here, whose luminosity is known. They are used to calculate distance to stars and galaxies using the inverse square law, which we'll talk about in just a bit. So luminosity is calculated based on predictable, measurable properties. And two standard candles are listed down here. So for example, we have the Cepheid variable stars. The time they take to brighten and dim is directly related to their luminosity. So regarding how they are calculated is outside of scope. Just know that Cepheid variable stars is a standard candle. Same goes to type A supernova. Now another term that is being used very often is the concept of light year. It's the distance that light travels in a year. So you know that this is the speed of light and you know that this is the number of seconds in a year. To calculate how far is one light year, you just use the light speed multiplied by the number of seconds in a year. So this will give you the amount of distance one light year carries. So one of the nearest star system to the sun is the Proxima Centauri. It's around 4.24 light years away from us. It appears dimmer than many stars because of its low luminosity. So this is the table that shows you the rank of the stars in terms of their brightness, followed by the distance from us and also their luminosity. So some observation that we can see is that Sirius A appear brightest after the sun due to high luminosity, which is here, and close distance. So Canopus is very far away. As you can see, it's 310 light years. It's very far, but it appears bright because of its very high luminosity. And Alpha Centauri A is closer than most, but has lower luminosity, so it appears less bright than the others. So the conclusion that we can get from it is that high luminosity plus far distance can still appear bright, even though they are far away and low luminosity plus close distance might appear dim because they just don't shine that much. And stars appear brightest when they have high luminosity and also when they are close to us. Now, having learned all the terms, now it's time to get into a bit of calculation. The first term that you have to calculate is the radiant flux intensity. It is the power received per unit area from a star. And to calculate that, we'll use the luminosity of the star divided by 4 pi d squared, where d is the distance from the stars, so you can see from this area here. And if you can't see it already, 4 pi d squared is actually the surface area of a sphere. So the assumption is that radiation from the star spreads uniformly in all the directions. And doubling the distance according to inverse square law will reduce f by 4 times, which is why further stars appears to be very dim. And the unit is watts per unit square meter, how much power they receive per unit area. Now let's solve a question here. Vega is a bright star with a known luminosity and the radiant flux is around this amount. Calculate the distance. So you can see that from this question, if we know the luminosity and we know what's the radiant flux, then we can calculate the distance between the two objects. So using the formula, so you can just make D the subject and then substitute the value and you would have gotten the distance just divided by this amount to get the amount in light years. So that's how far Vega is away from us. Now let's move on to stellar radius. Stellar radius is the distance from the center of a star to its outer surface. It tells us how big the star is. It is measured in meters. The larger the star, the greater its surface area, and hence the more light it can emit. So for all the stars, they actually emit a wide range of electromagnetic radiation. But there's a peak wavelength, which is the electromagnetic radiation that has the highest wavelength, where the radiation is strongest. 
and the peak depends on the temperature of the star's surface. So what do I mean by that? So you can see that different stars have different surface temperature and as a result of that, the color that shows they are also quite different. Alright, so we know that the energy emitted by a star can be explained using this formula, E equal to hc over lambda, which is the wavelength. So the higher the temperature, they actually emit more energy and as a result, the wavelength is shorter, which is why if a star's surface is hotter, the peak wavelength will be shorter according to this formula. And shorter wavelength here means blue color. So the star appear white or blue, as you can see here, when the surface temperature is very high. So if the star's surface is cooler, the peak wavelength will be longer, and longer wavelength means redder light that will appear like orange and red color to our eyes. So the scientists mean discovered the relationship between the wavelength at which emission is strongest, which is what color, and the surface temperature. He discovered that there is a relationship between them, and he described the relationship using this formula, lambda temperature equal to constant. And the constant that he calculated is this amount. I'm going to show you how to use this formula in a bit. But before that, let's look into another law, Stefan Boltzmann law. This law will be used with the wind displacement law in a bit. It tells us that the luminosity of a star depends on two things, surface temperature and also size. For example, a small, very hot star may be less luminous than a large, cooler star. So hot, it doesn't mean bright unless it is bigger too. So you can calculate luminosity based on these different quantities, radius and temperature. So to help you to understand how to use these two formulas together, I have this example. So Betelgeuse is a red supergiant located in the constellation Orion. It is visible to the naked eyes, which is something that we can see. And that indicates that it has a relatively cool surface temperature. So the question asks us to calculate the radius. We know that we can use this formula. But before that, one quantity that is missing is the surface temperature. It is not given. So to find out the surface temperature, I have to use the wind displacement law. So I'm just going to write down the equation and use the peak wavelength, which is the, the color that we see, to calculate the amount of temperature in Kelvin. And after that, once I gotten the temperature, I can use the other values here to help me to calculate the radius by using the Stephen Boltzmann formula. So because we are finding radius, just make R the subject, rearrange the equation. So if you multiply 3000 by 4 times, you would have gotten the temperature here. You just substitute the value and then you will get the radius in meter already. So that's how you can use both equations to solve a question. Well, in the last part of the video, to end up this series of A-level physics, we will talk about the birth of the universe, which is the Big Bang Theory. So the Big Bang Theory is the leading explanation of how the universe began from singularity. It proposes that space, time and matter all originated from a singular point, which is around this amount of years ago and the universe has been expanding ever since. So for the later part of the video, I'm going to show you what are the proofs that people have come up with to prove this theory. First theory is the Hubble's law. So when the astronomer used telescope to observe the galaxy, they found out that the farther away a galaxy is, the faster it appears to be moving away. And this observation is known as Hubble's law. So this is the graph that describes Hubble's law. They found out that planets or stars that are further away from us their recession speed, velocity, that they are moving away from us is also higher. So they plotted all the points, draw the line of best fit, and this will be the equation that we'll use to sort of to estimate the age of the universe. But before that, you might be asking, but how do we know if an object is moving away from us? So the answer is that we will use Doppler effect, something that we learn about it when we are learning sound. This is the diagram that I showed in the sound video. So we know that, for example, an ambulance siren sounds higher when approaching something and lower when moving away. And you can see that when they are moving away from this person here, the wavelength increases. So what we observe from the universe is light, light that reaches the telescope and help us to see what it is. So if a galaxy moves away from us, the wavelength of the light will also increase based on this diagram here. And the term for the increase in wavelength of light is called redshifting. So redshift is the increase in wavelength of light due to a source moving away from us and it is explained by the Doppler effect. It implies that galaxies are receding means moving away from us. The greater the redshift, the faster the galaxy is moving away. So this is the method that scientists use to determine if an object is moving away from us. So there are times when we also need to quantify how much they are moving away from us. That's when we have the Doppler redshift the amount of redshift tells us 
how fast the galaxy is receding, the faster it moves away, the more stretched the wavelength becomes. So we can use this formula to calculate how fast they are moving away from us. So you can either use wavelength or frequency, just use the amount of change in wavelength divided by the wavelength, then that will be our ratio. To help you to apply properly, I have a work example. The astronomer was observing this neighbor and they detect a spectral line that is normally emitted at this wavelength, but what they measure is this wavelength instead. So the wavelength has been stretched for around 26 nanometer. So they will use the value here, 26 is the difference, 520 is the original wavelength, and just substitute the speed of light, and they found out the recession speed of this NGC 4414. And this is how you can use the formula here to identify how fast they move away. So if a galaxy has a redshift of 12%, it means that it is receding at this amount of speed here. All right, it's just a ratio. So one misconception for people is that they thought that the universe is expanding from Earth, that Earth is the middle point, but actually, the universe is currently being expanded in all direction, not from just a single location. So if, if everything is expanding now, scientists hypothesize that there must be a point in which everything begins, which is when the Hubble's law equation comes in. So this is the equation that we have. If you were to do a bit of rearrangement, just move D down and then inverse the equation, you will get this. But how is this equation going to prove the age of the universe? We know that the speed formula is speed equal to distance over time. So for time, we can calculate it using distance divided by V. So you can see from here, I am currently matching the two equations here, which means that time can also be equal to one over H O, which is the Hubble's constant. And it has been computed using the line of best fit that we see in Hubble's law just now. So if you substitute the value, you'll get that time is this amount of seconds. And if you convert that time into years, that's 13.8 billion years. So this gives us an estimate for the age of the universe, which is one major discovery by Stephen Hawking. He says one equation to summarize everything. And that's how the age of the universe is estimated. All right, thank you so much for watching. I think that's the end of this video and the end of this series. I haven't think of what to do next, but let me see. I shall see you in the next video. Goodbye.